Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Business in Hawaii. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama, and today I'm the guest host for the show that really highlights, promotes business in Hawaii, especially small business that really needs really help in really meeting the challenges to become successful and to earn a profit, to really hire new employees and the backbone of the state economy. And today we have Reg Baker, who sits usually in my seat. And this is April, wow, almost the 15th, almost. And New Year's seems ages ago, and now we are nearly at the end of tax season. And Reg has been involved in the middle of this new tax reform change, the new laws that were passed in 2017. So any takeaways as we complete this tax season? Well, I am a true uh, survivor of the tax season. <laughs> this, this has gone down in history as is probably one of the worst tax seasons oh. that the industry has ever seen. And worst meaning what? For whom? Uh, mostly, well, for actually, I think for almost everybody. Um, you know, the, the tax preparers themselves right. have had some particular challenges because not only do they have to process the, the volume of, of transactions for 2017, right. uh, in, in just a few months. Usually right. you get started in February and you're done by first week or so of, of April. So right. you've got about 80% of your business for the entire year compressed right. into just a, a few months. Um, so they had to deal with that and for 2017, but then on top of that was all the confusion created by the 2018 tax reform. Right. A lot of people didn't understand right. what started now, what started later. Okay, wait a minute, what's this mortgage interest in 2017? Right. What's this alimony in 2017? Does that impact me? And Just a lot of questions, a lot of commotion. So those are questions from your clients, but what, what about the IRS? Did they deal with it in an efficient manner? No, huh? um, you know, they're understaffed. They've had their budget cut every year for the last 10 years. Uh, they're running probably at a staffing level of about 70% of where they're supposed to be. Um, they've got uh, a, a real brain drain going on. A lot of people are bailing out. There's just not the, the knowledge there anymore that used to be. Um, but then on top of the 2017 season, the tax, the IRS and tax preparers and taxpayers are all wrestling with, uh, the 2018 kicks in, first quarter payments, estimated tax payments oh, for the first right. quarter, <laughs> comes in April 20th. Right. So everybody's got to be ready to do their 2018 estimates. Right, right. And they haven't done the forms yet. Oh. They haven't done the instructions yet. They don't really know exactly how it's all going to work. So the IRS is struggling with this. The tax preparers are as well as the preparers, uh, the payers. Now, this was a result of the impact of the new regulations or laws passed last year by Congress. And that uh, was to become tax reform. Or tax, yes. uh, and you said it, that there haven't been any changes, dramatic changes to tax code for decades. I mean, a, a, a long time. You know, Ray, when I was going to college, right. and that was a little while ago, <laughs> they were talking about tax reform. Okay. We're talking about back in the early 80s. Wow. You know, they were talking about tax reform back in the very early 80s. Uh, and we've been waiting for it ever since. That's Ronald Reagan, <laughs> a, a, a presidential and, uh, term at that point. And this is, uh, this is uh, Donald Trump. And look at how many presidents and time, years have passed. Now, was that all overdue or all of a sudden? And, and in the end, for some people, they thought the world would end with the new tax regulations, that the rich will pay nothing and the poor will pay tremendously more. What happened? 
Well, as what normally happens is that the journalists got it all wrong. <laughs> you know, they're not tax experts. They're not. They can't know everything. Because and you're so, in the trenches and preparing the forms for many, many clients, and you work with CPAs, and you talk among themselves, right? Well, and you know, we also are involved in helping. You know, um, you know with, with some of the, the elected officials understanding what the implications are when they do these things. And so, you know, it's not as if the, the CPAs just sit there and don't do anything. They're actively engaged. In the process as well, and they give some thoughts. So, um, and advice to the people who are passing the laws. So, there's a lot of knowledge out there that's going around. But what happens, and if you've ever watched the process, uh, that bill, which is you know a few thousand pages thick, <laughs> Correct. if you yes. go, if you were watching yeah. the process as it was yeah. being negotiated, and you flip through those pages, you'll see a lot of scribbling, red marks, right. xing things out, and scribbling in the margins, and all of these individuals that were negotiating to pass this thing was making changes to it mm. during that process. Okay. Nobody understood exactly <laughs> how that was going to work. Yeah. And so it's just going to take a while to, to go through that and, and see exactly what the implications are. But I can tell you, uh, and I think DBED just came out with some reports on this, and, and I know that the, uh, the IRS tracks this, but you know the top 10% of wage earners, the, the richest 10% right, in the entire country, they US. pay 95% of all taxes. Wow. So when people say that the rich don't pay, right. it's ludicrous. Right. And, and so um, this is also a midterm election year, uh, November. Uh, however, we were talking that it probably will not have an impact on new regula tax regulations. We are still wrestling with the uh, a package that was passed by Congress last year right. for uh, tax year 2018. Am I correct? Yes. We've got the, the Tax Reform Act itself, which is a, a couple thousand pages, and then we got the rules, the regulations, the interpretations, and then we have the forms and the instructions. Um, if you've ever looked at some of the instructions, for example, depreciation is 150 pages of instructions <laughs> on how to do depreciation. Wow. All right. Anytime you change with the formulas, yeah. um, tweak the formulas, or put bonus depreciation in, or do this or do that, all that's got to change. Hmm. It's all got to be updated. And so that's what the IRS is working on right now. We, we're not even sure if they're going to be done with it by the time the end of the year rolls around. So we're going to be winging some yeah. of this stuff for the rest of the year. If so if midterm elections come in and we've got new people in play in power right. and they want to start changing the tax code, right. maybe put it back where it was, <laughs> you know, there's just between the time that they win and take office, there's right. not going to be enough time no, to uh, get it done. They'll be in office in January, so we, we don't see any new laws passed. So but, we, we, but again, we have spring of next year, yes. 2019. Uh, that Congress, uh, you know, by March, April may do something. They might. You never know. So you're also telling me that um, if you had a question, one of your clients had on depreciation, could that person, and you uh, forwarded the question or, or to the IRS, would they have the answer? For the most part. Well, I wouldn't forward the question on oh. to the IRS. If the taxpayer uh, wanted to ask a question to the IRS, and many do, um, they are certainly, they have helplines, right, they right, have right. online right, capabilities. Right. There's a lot of information available out there that they can do the research and right. find out answers oh, on their okay. own. But if they do make contact, right. and usually they may have to wait anywhere from an hour or two mm. or three right. to right. finally reach a person, uh, their accuracy level and getting the answer right is fairly low. Oh, wow. So you got to be sure that, um, you know, you uh, trust but confirm. Okay, so so this is really a, a, a phase. What is this a in-between time uh, about, uh, you know, getting, uh, really becoming knowledgeable about the tax code uh, and that uh, there, there wasn't much time to, uh, really learn and digest and analyze it for many people. So many people are just proceeding along, but they're in a gray area. Am I correct? Or, or well, try, you know what's interesting? Answers. I think there's a lot of taxpayers out there that work in the gray area all the time when it comes to taxes. You know, it's a very complicated mm -hmm. body of knowledge. 
you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, every time they do a massive tax reform or a tax act like this, uh, people joke about it being a full employment act for attorneys and CPAs. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's a lot of truth to that because it's a very complicated area. But going back, but going back to your uh, historical focus that, you know, since the time you were in college and that, in last year, there wasn't much uh, changes, uh, but well, uh, w w uh, did the changes come? And it was a it was a good time, uh, or it, it had to come. Let me let me say this: yeah. we have not had true tax reform in 25 years. Right. Okay. But we have had a lot of change in the tax code every year. Right. Right. You know, dollar right. amounts change. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, you can yeah. do six percent of medical right. expense, right. seven and a half percent, ten percent. But the know, major uh, nothing well, significant, yeah. Yeah. but there are changes every year. And that just tends I mean, just when somebody figures out what they're doing and how it's working they got to relearn it because <laughs> okay. they, it's changed again. Right. So there's unless you work with it all the time, right, right, you're right. not going to really grasp it and be wow. comfortable with it. You know, some people just look at taxes once a year. Yeah, that's right. Now, that's and right. that's dangerous because yeah. tax rates can go anywhere from you know 20 to to 50 percent. Mm. And I don't know of any interest rates anywhere that go that high anymore. Right. You know, so <laughs> if, if you can save a thousand dollars in taxes, you could have saved yourself three or four hundred dollars. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what you're telling me is, is that uh, you know, for some, some people, of course, for many people, uh, this is an arcane area. And uh, again, uh, people like yourself try to uh, make it much more simple. But uh, it, is, it is really hard, even for yourself, that uh, studies it and reviews it every year. My, my advice, Ray, is find a, a, a tax preparer. It doesn't have to necessarily be a CPA, but find a tax preparer you're comfortable with, and then sit down and just develop a relationship with that person for a few years and, and have them work with you mm -hmm. on doing a tax return right, and, right. and have them sit down and explain it to you and what's going on and why and, and here's some things to look for. Um, there are tax organizers out there that most tax preparers can provide that helps organize things and, and put in, the, if you could just put 10 hours or 20 hours a year Right. Into thinking about taxes, you could save yourself a lot of money. It's better to prepare, for even uh, preparing now for next year. Right. right. You're, you're absolutely right. Well, uh, let's move on to another topic, which is. Uh, Good, because I'm tired of taxes. <laughs> you're survivor. You're survivor. <laughs> We're looking at a survivor. The SBA, the Small Business Administration Awards, and yes. it's part of the Hawaii business uh, affiliation here. Well, what's happening with the advocates in Hawaii? You know, the Small Business Administration has always been a huge advocate for small business not only in Hawaii but throughout the country and Jane Sawyer heads up the SBA here locally for the, the Hawaii district which by the way is, is the largest district in the entire country wow. it covers not only Hawaii but also American Samoa and Guam uh, and she's a it's a very big geographical area population wise maybe not so big right, but right. geographically yeah, it's, it's, it's huge, huge. It's huge. and we're to, dominated by small businesses right. now the SBA's definition of a small business is 500 employees or less or 5 million <laughs> sales. So yeah. that's 97, 98% yeah. oh, yeah. of all the businesses well, so. uh, in that territory. Um, but, you know, she's done a super job over there. She sets records in, in working with the banks locally, providing capital uh, to small businesses. Uh, they have training all the time, to, you know, emerging mm -hmm. leaders training, uh, helping you go through, develop a business plan, right, right, implement, right. execute, manage the company. Uh, and a lot of the SBA awardees every year are actually graduates from these programs because they've done so well that they become some of the top businesses, small businesses in Hawaii. And we'll go back to the uh, banquet and reception after this break. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. 
Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Good afternoon. This is Ray Tichiyama on Business in Hawaii with uh, Reg Baker, and I'm the guest host here, and we're diving into the SBA Awards, a Small Business Administration, a great advocate for small business in Hawaii. And what is this uh, award ceremony and, and, and winners all about? Well, this year it's going to be at the Hawaii Prince uh, in Waikiki. Uh, traditionally, it's been at the Dole Cannery, uh, but we're going to, you know, move it upscale a little great, bit. And great. Uh, but there's about 10 or 15 awardees every year that the SBA nominates. There's a judging process that takes place, which is very rigorous. Um, these awards, and I can't emphasize this enough, these awards are based totally on merit. There are no requirements for advertising, no requirements for tables or ticket sales or tables for vendors. Uh, this is totally based on merit, based on the application itself, the sales numbers, oh, the look, number look, of employees. We have, we have the show. That's, yeah. that's uh, the, the, the promo piece for it at the Prince right. in Waikiki. It's on uh, the Friday the 4th. Uh, it's usually a very well attended event. There'll be uh, anywhere about three to 400 people there. And if anybody wants to get a ticket, oh, who, they, who should they contact? Uh, they can go to Hawaii Business Magazine right. website. They can go to the sba.gov slash Hawaii website. Uh, they can get more information on that. Um, you can have a table there. They've got ticket sales. They've got table sales. Uh, it's usually a very good event. And it's and a great networking event. You meet other CEOs and other advocates for well, business. And you get to see who the top small businesses are in Hawaii and what the products are they sell. And you right. can even hear about some of their stories, right. you know, which is always educational. Well, you've been doing so many of the inspirational stories of their success. And it's a lot of hard work, a lot of smarts, and really a focus on how to really bring a great product that meets customer needs. And, and, and you're a, a fantastic advocate. You've won the award twice in your career. I have. I, I was the financial advocate uh, for the state of Hawaii about 20 years ago and then just last year. Oh, so it's kind of nice. It was a 20 year break in there, but you know, I guess I, I was younger then and yeah. now I'm the senior guy. No, no, so. no. It's still highlighted for your great work on behalf of business in Hawaii. But we go on to other advocacy uh, causes you've been involved with, the Small Business Board, and you go to meetings and get together. What, what is that all about? Well, the SBA has a national board of directors that oversees regulatory fairness for the entire country. Uh, and it's broken up into nine regions. I'm chair of region nine, which is the Western United States. Uh, and what we do is we just evaluate uh, all the different federal regulations. And right now, the current administration, Trump's administration, has got 300 uh, regulations that they've identified that they want to get evaluated and either change or get rid of. And they're chipping away at that. They're, they're slowly making some progress there. Uh, that, we, that's among thousands. <laughs> so, so, let's face it. But if not but, millions. But, but you're, you're involved with the West Coast then, and also Hawaii. Well, when you say, uh, yeah, it, uh, includes, West, it yeah. includes Hawaii. So, so yes. there's a lot of companies out there, plus Hawaii, that want to really look at these regulations. Well, and we we are open. They, they submit a one-page form to us. Any of these companies that are encountering a certain rule of regulations that that are impacting their business in a negative way. They fill out this real simple, it takes maybe 10 minutes, so you just fill out this real simple one-page form, send it into us, we put it into the pipeline, and we'll kick it over to the, the agency that oversees it, uh, and they'll, normally take some action on it. Well, this is a bottom-up approach, which is terrific, that, that you see people in the trenches trying to make their business grow, yep. but they may be affected by some regulation or law that really um, uh, that is an obstacle to hiring people or making a better product and getting it out to market. Yeah, and there's a really good example of this. You've, you've probably heard of the term medical device. Right. 
Well, medical devices, particularly as the, the population gets older, becomes more and more important. There, and these medical devices can be as simple as a, a hospital bed that's right. put in the, the home oh, yeah, yeah. for a uh, person who's not mobile that would have to stay there. And then, you know, there may be pieces of equipment that's hooked up to them. But, you know, medical devices has become a very important part of our Kapuna, you know the right, whole right, the right. whole older generation right. needs right. this. There's there's a few companies out there that actually provide medical devices, uh, and it's paid for by Medicare or right. Medicaid. Right. Now just bear with me a, okay. a second. Um, what happens in federal contracting is that when these individuals come in and need this medical device, and, and some of these hospital beds could cost ten fifteen thousand dollars. These medical device companies have to buy the bid at their own expense. They have to purchase it out of their own money. Then they have to send somebody else to set it up, to train the people how to use it, what buttons to push, and all this kind of stuff. And, and this could take two or three months for this to happen before the claim even gets submitted to Medicare for payment. Now, they have examiners that if the doctor forgot to maybe check a box on the prescription for this bid, they would reject the payment. And it could take several months of going back and forth through the audit process to get paid. Now multiply this by 50 or 100 oh, yeah, times right. you know, for these medical device companies. Uh, medical device companies have one of the biggest failure rates mm. in the country because they can't get paid, they go bankrupt yeah, right, because of this. Right. This was brought to the attention of the Medicare, Medicaid mm. offices, uh, and they were able to address it and fix it. And you know what the problem was? The examiners, the, the ones that were going in there looking for these little uh, omissions that hold up the payment, they were paid a commission on all the ones that they got rejected. Oh, no. <laughs> so they were motivated to find oh, these no. things. And, you know, and once they changed the, the, the right. compensation right. model of these examiners, right. Bang! Everything now works smoothly. The people are getting and the, the you know what they need. The, the medical device companies are surviving. Um, it, it was a, a significant change, and that all came th about because of this one-page form that was submitted uh, and went through the system. And sometimes it's so small, but it's part of the bureaucratic you know nightmare that we unintended sometimes. <laughs> consequences. <laughs> and, you know. and, and again, we're a society that wants to provide better care for our senior population. That's mm -hmm. growing all the time. In fact, in a few years, there may be one in four, age 65 and older in Hawaii, and, and should be a, a priority. And so it's part of your uh, small business regulatory review board that you also uh, been working on. Now, the, Hawaii also has one. The, the, the SBA one is at the federal level. Uh, Governor Ige just appointed me, and I just got confirmed last week uh, from the Senate. I'm on the uh, Hawaii small business regulatory reform board here locally. Right. So I get to look at, at both state level and federal level rules and regulations and uh, and hopefully have some impact on making things a little bit better for the, the regulatory environment for small businesses. So what, what you're doing is that um, uh, you're looking at regulations and laws and, and making recommendations to the governor. Uh, and, you know, take a little look at this. So why don't, why don't we you know, focus on what exactly is happening here and, and, and really what's the priority to get things uh, smoother for small businesses? Is that the uh, kind yeah. of outcome that you're To give them a, a better chance of surviving. You know, um, one of the, if somebody were to ask me what, what is the biggest rule or regulation now that I think could have the biggest impact, I would probably say the Jones Act. Oh, right, right, right. The ships, you know, the shipping, yeah. Yeah, the, the Jones Act, and, and I know uh, Kalihi Aquino over the grassroots right. is a big one on this. As a matter of fact, uh, Kalihi and I ended up going to Washington oh, last right. year and, yeah. and provided testimony uh, trying to get an exemption for Hawaii from the Jones Act. Wasn't there an ex exemption recently for Puerto Rico after the hurricane, yes. and, and that's because yes. Puerto Rico needed anything from everybody. I mean, yep. they were in dire straits. Yep, yep. And so there are president for having exceptions. And the Jones Act is that uh, it, it's, it's that ships have to be U.S. registered, am I correct? To bring uh, uh, things to, uh, to yes. the United States. Yes, or any port between any, any U.S. port. Oh, you okay. know, and You know, and so what happens a lot of times in uh, you know, Kalihi Aquina is probably better versed in being able to explain all the nuances, but we have a lot of uh, ships 
that are filled with, say, for example, Toyotas right, or Nissans right, right. or Hyundais or, yeah. or other product that we might be buying from China or right. Asia or Korea, and they have to come right by us. Oh. <laughs> they they, they yeah. ship right by us. Yeah. They go all the way to Long Beach right. or, or go to uh, Seattle or wherever, uh, unload, right. reload. Right and come back, then they can come to... Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, when we moved from Tokyo to Hawaii, um, uh, I was told that the shipping rates would be cheaper if I shipped it to LA. <laughs> and I said, why? Because it, it, it's a shorter distance from Tokyo to Honolulu. No, they have to carry it first to LA, they have to re-put uh, the container on another ship, and then bring it to Honolulu. I said, that's bizarre. Yeah. And then there's nothing that we, uh, uh, unfortunately, manufacture, so the ship goes back empty to LA. <laughs> yep, they, they call that deadheading. They they deadhead back. That's right, and they have to pay uh, for the it's, fuel and you know uh, uh, sailors on the ship well, to, and that's to go there. One of the big reasons why the cost of living is so high here in Hawaii is because of the Jones Act, and we should get an exemption for that. But it's uh, people will claim that it's got. Um, you know, the national security issues, you know, we need to have a strong shipbuilding capability, and there's no arguing with that. Um, but I don't think that just having ships from Japan stop here to drop things off <laughs> is going to destroy the U.S. shipbuilding. No, no, no. I mean, so. this would, uh, uh, I, I, on the contrary, I, our, our congressional team should be lobbying for more of this because Hawaii should be a bridge, export and import to Asia. And this is a, a kind of a very clear indication of uh, one obstacle to business, uh, doing business in Hawaii. It's a huge one. And just not only business, but look at the entire community. Yeah. And the, and the entire community is impacted by these higher costs. Last thing, you, you've been involved in the East Oahu Chamber of Commerce uh, yes, launching that. What yes. is that story? Well, you know, that, that's been interesting to watch this grow and evolve over the years. This is the the Hawaii Kai Chamber of Commerce for many, many years. It's, it's been there for a very long time. Um, but the Hawaii Kai Chamber, just there's just not enough business activity there to support and have an active chamber. So, you know, it was strong. Struggling. Uh, and so we've decided to, to change the geographical or the territory of the chamber and rename it East Oahu. So Perfect. now it represents all of East Oahu that goes from Kapahulu, right. Kahala, oh, wow. uh, yeah. you know, you know, Waimanalo maybe? Or, or whereabouts? No, it stops at the. Um, Sea Life Park. Oh, okay, okay. But that's, so, that's, 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 yeah, beyond that is country. <laughs> yeah, well, now we get into the Kailua chamber right, side, right, right. Okay. and, and they, they, they don't want us over there. So. Okay, I got it. So, uh, yeah, but the East Oahu Chamber, well, on the Haina, New right, Valley, right, and if right. you think oh, about it, these yeah. are all the top. Oh, yeah. High net worth uh, zip codes in the entire high, state. High zip, a lot of, yeah. high a lot net of, worth individuals and business people live yep, out there, yep, right? Yep. So we, we're capturing all of that. We're going to start a, a small business council that's going to focus on small business, oh, and, and we're going to you know, provide some uh, you know, networking opportunity, a lot of training. Uh, we're going to try to start rebuilding and, and getting a thriving type of small business advocacy going uh, for the East Oahu Chamber. Well, we're going to end on that note. And and you're looking great. Uh, you're a survivor of tax season, and uh, maybe we can have another show next year at this time to see what happened uh, for uh, for uh, tax year 2000. Well, hopefully everybody will recognize me because every tax season makes me a, a whole lot older. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much.